for the first time in the series, I'm actually going to Brussels. Hello, prachtig. <laughs> and over there I will meet uh, two uh, biohackers that live in the capital of Europe. Hi and welcome back at the Open Biotech vlog series. In this series I'm vlogging about the process of writing a policy paper for the European Commission on Do-It-Yourself Bio. And for that I have to go through a lot of articles and research that has been done in the past. But sometimes I get the opportunity to speak actually to one of those researchers. All right, Gunther, you wrote this article uh, three years ago. Um, and it was a bit of an analysis of the do-it-yourself uh, movement in Europe at that time. Um, what do you think are the ma main differences between uh, the do-it-yourself movement in 2014 and now in 2017? Not so many differences. I mean, what we didn't look closely at that time was like the, the micro politics behind uh, innovation supporting measures taken okay. by states or the European Union, for example. So what do you think is the role of the government in the do-it-yourself bio movement? Yeah, it could play a, a big role because uh, I mean the, the government already has institutions on na national and European level like uh, national science farms in every country and they have programs for all kinds of scientific or artistic activities. So it would be uh, maybe very good if they're in, inside the structures there would be a program that specially addresses like DIY bio or do it together bio activities uh, or endeavors. In this article, you also analyzed, uh, or actually, you mentioned how the media portrays the do it yourself bio movement. Uh, that often there are some kind of polarity between uh, the hopes and the horrors. Um, is that still the same nowadays, as three years later? Yeah, it's still the same. Um, if you just read some uh, articles of German major newspapers like the Zeit and, and others, you could see it even Gantt, <laughs> uh, uh, it even uh, build up on that kind of negative portrayal. But it always depends on the country you're in. So you see uh, bigger diversity in Europe. So countries like Germany, they are very skeptical about uh, do-it-yourself bio. And so they, in the newspaper they call it biohacking more than they call it DIY bio or do it together bio. So you can see there is a general hostility, maybe for out of skeptical reasons. So. so I think one of the major insights that we gained from the interview with Gunther and this paper is that the support by local governments for do-it-yourself bio movements has made a big impact on whether those uh, groups have been able to grow or not. All right, it's time to leave the Waag building behind and to go to Brussels. In this cafe behind me, I made an appointment with two biohackers, Elise of a mushroom project here in Brussels and Winnie from Reagent, which is a community biolab in Ghent. Yes, so I'm Winnie. I'm from Ghent, and in Ghent we started the, the DIY Biolab reagent. I'm uh, Elisa, I'm from Brussels, and I'm doing um, research about um, mycelium uh, materials. And Elisa, what are you working on right now? Um, so I'm, like, on one hand I'm doing research, um, so it's a, a PhD research on uh, trying to understand more how this um, mycelium materials work and how we can apply them in uh, architectural engineering and on the other hand I'm uh, giving workshops to um, everyone who is interested to participate to them uh, to learn them how they can make um, those um, mycelium materials so these mushroom materials themselves at home. And I really wonder you know, do you have recommendations on what I should put in that policy paper? Um, Yes, so we have noticed that at different levels of policy there is a lot of time and energy and money being spent on trying to understand the movement, giving us a platform to tell our story, studying us uh, most of the time. And I would like this time and energy and money being spent in actually helping us cross the gap between where we are now, which is basically 
really DIY in basements and crossing the gap to um, being sustainable in the long term, financially, but also with all the as other aspects to this long term sustainability to help us realize the, the impact that we, that we want to achieve. And Elisa, how about you? What do you think about European policy and do-it-yourself bio? I think that, um, well, from my experience, I, I started actually in the DIY biosphere and this is how I gained experience in doing research because I didn't have the background in the beginning. I jumped into uh, the academic world um, and it's interesting to support uh, those initiatives because usually it's done the way around. So um, a researcher study in a lab and then maybe eventually they, got, they get involved into uh, biohacking. I believe that it would be interesting to uh, support um, how you can really do uh, research and hack uh, research on an academic level uh, with the same mindset as biohackers have. Right. Right. You're also you're carrying your own bio experiments around through the city. Yes, we are. Uh, as it stands, we had a well. We we were starting a project today, so we yeah. are carrying around some experiments to take to take home. So we're carrying a backpack of uh, fungus around today in Brussels. Yeah, right. so, this, so Peter, uh, we have the impression that uh, in the Netherlands there are a lot of eccentric uh, people. Do they also um, come into your lab? Yeah, I, I think so, you know, by having an open lab, you meet actually people from all walks of life. And uh, especially since we're doing do-it-yourself bio, which is, I think, eccentric in itself already. Sometimes it attracts really strange people. I had once in a lab a guy who was trying to invent a uh, uh, treatment for HIV by electrocuting himself. Okay. So <laughs> it was really weird. He had this installation at home with a glass table on which he could uh, put some high frequency uh, through his body. and. Um, he was hoping that through uh, yeah, some kind of the right frequency that, that the, the HIV virus would resonate out of his DNA. It was really strange. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we get that a lot. And But I also think that's the beauty of the whole movement, that there's yeah. room for people with totally different visions and ideas. And they mix and mingle with science and arts. And uh, you never know what you can expect from that. <laughs> And uh, so where do uh, biohackers actually go to eat uh, in the evening here in Brussels? <laughs> um, maybe we can go uh, and get some uh, french fries. Belgian fries. Belgian fries. <laughs> <laughs> Even better. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go there. Yes. Prachtig. <laughs> so my time in Brussels is up. Uh, I'm going back to Amsterdam after speaking to uh, two magnificent biohackers. And we're also halfway through the first part of this vlogging series on my way to uh, Geneva, to the biofabbing conference there uh, at the 10th, 11th and 12th of May. And uh, meanwhile I've been starting to write the policy paper and the outline is going to be uh, a short introduction of course, a description of a number of case studies of do-it-yourself bio, uh, we'll reflect on some RRI and ethics elements and of course uh, some requests or insights in uh, funding and the potential impact of that. In case you think that can be done better or there's a more logical structure to that, just post it in the comments. I'll be happy to uh, hear from you what uh, suggestions you have. Um, you can also just subscribe to this channel, like this video, so that you'll automatically see the next episodes appearing.